Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Chem Bali 2020, a Rebuild Bali Festival, a digital program designed to inspire, excite, reconnect and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian community, which runs from the 29th of October to the 8th of November 2020. Kembali, the Indonesian word for return or come back, represents revitalization in the face of global challenges. The festival will unite people in Bali and Indonesia together with an international audience at a time when travel is largely impossible and creating connections is more important than ever before. So now I'm going to introduce, introduce the moderator. The moderator is me. I'm Simon Winchester. And today we're going to talk to a wonderful speaker who's written two extraordinary books that have been recently published uh, related to her own experiences and to the larger picture in Polynesia generally, New Zealand specifically at the beginning and Polynesia more widely in the, in the second most recent book. Her name is Christina Thompson and she lives in and around Boston. She's a dual citizen of the United States where we both are because I'm in Western Massachusetts, the other end of the state to her and she is in the east of the state. And uh, she's also a citizen of Australia, although oddly enough, and I'll ask her about this, she was apparently born in Switzerland, but she'll, I dare say, tell me. So the title of the event, I'm not quite sure what it is, but <laughs> essentially it's about a most recent book, which is called Sea People, The Puzzle of Polynesia. And the first book, which we're going to talk about initially, has got this extraordinary title, very alluring, uh, called Come On Shore, and we will kill and eat you all. So without further ado, hello, Christina. Good morning, Simon. Thank you for Good that morning. lovely it introduction. It is morning, morning here. It's a gloomy day. So I hope whenever this is broadcast in Bali, it's crystal clear and beautiful and the volcano is behaving itself. It wasn't when I was last there. So um, we're going to talk about largely about Polynesia. Um, your interest in it is to a very large degree, personal. So I want to ask you, when you made that trip some years ago that inspired the Come On Shore and We Will Kill You and Eat You All book, it was all about meeting your husband-to-be. So tell us, you were a youngster then, not that you're old today, but you were a young student, effectively. Uh, you had been home to see your parents, I think, in, in the United States. We're coming back on that long, long trek across the Pacific and then something happened. So this, to a degree, inspired your interest in, in Polynesia. Tell us about that trip and what happened. So I, I had made a, a little before that trip, so I'm confused before that trip, I had made this rather odd decision to go and do graduate work in Australia. This was um, an eccentric decision. Uh, at least it was perceived to be an eccentric decision by my parents. So um, I went off and became a graduate student. I was working for a PhD in Australia and I was going back and forth across the Pacific quite a lot. And I made this pit stop in New Zealand to see what New Zealand was like. I guess I was coming back from Boston, that's right. It was Christmas time. And um, I was just traveling by myself and I went up to the Bay of Islands because that was where they told me to go in the tourist office in Auckland. And I was just wandering around. And then I, on the, my very last day, my last afternoon, I ended up in this pub in Kerry Kerry or Kitty Kitty in the, um, the Bay of Islands. And I, there was a, I was just sitting there and talking with various people. And there was a fight that broke out between this Maori guy and this Pakia guy, Pakia being the name for the white people. And I thought it was mesmerizing. I was watching it and I was, they were fighting and I was thinking to myself, what is this about? What is going on here? And I got started talking, it kind of subsided and they went off with bloody noses and bad feelings. And they said to this guy that I was standing next to, what, what is this? What is going on here? And he said, oh, you know, that guy pointing to one of them, he's not from around here. And I'm like, what? <laughs> that was it? <laughs> So anyway, I ended up marrying that person I talked to. <laughs> and then moved to 
Australia or back to the United States? Where did you first settle? I think you settled in Australia, didn't you? Right. We were going back and forth a lot in those days. I was a graduate student in Australia. So then I went back to Australia. He then came to Australia. You know, we spent some time together and then yeah. he came to Australia. And then, um, I mean, we didn't get married that week, you know. Um, and then we went back and forth again. We were in Hawaii for a year. We were in Queensland for a couple of years back in Australia. We were back in the United States for a year. And eventually we lived in Australia mostly for quite a few years. And then um, we came back to the United States in just before I started writing that book, actually, was when we returned. I started writing that book when we returned to the United States. I think it was nostalgia that prompted me. <laughs> It turns out of interest, I don't want to be unseemly and overly personal, but what was the reaction of your family to you marrying a Maori? Um, Maori's, I don't know, things have changed a lot in the perception, but there was that film called what, We Were Kings or... Once Were Warriors. Yes, Once Were Warriors, which painted a somewhat bleak picture of, of, of Maori life in, in urban New Zealand anyway. And... What what effectively, how did your parents feel about it initially? Well, you know, I hadn't been doing anything the conventional way. I had, you know, not gone to the schools they expected me to go to. I had then gone off to Australia and parked myself there for ultimately what ultimately turned out to be 15 years. So, I mean, I don't think it was any big surprise that I would do something kind of not. There's a joke in the book in which I say, you know, I could have stayed home and married a radiologist, which... It was, <laughs> sorry about the radiologist joke, but to me, there was some sense that, you know, I, mean, I think everybody understood that that was the kind of thing I might, that I might do something like this. But I think the really difficult thing for my family, it wasn't difficult, they loved my husband and he has been, uh, you know, just a fantastic member of the family all these years. He was very kind to my father when my father was dying. I mean, he, he's just been a huge, wonderful asset, you know, but at the time they had no idea who he was, where he was from, what kind of people those were, where they lived, how they lived. And the other thing was that he didn't have really any education. He was a tradesman and he had a trade education and, you know, I was a PhD student and that was also odd from many people's point of view. Um, you know, it worked out great for me and I think for him, I hope. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Sure it did. I mean, conversely, what, I don't want to dig too deep into this, but what was the, the Maori community's um, reaction to him marrying a Pakaha person? Well, I think it was not so uncommon, you know. Um, there were a lot, it was much more common for him to marry, I mean, I was a tourist. He actually had a cousin who also married a tourist who was from Germany, because they lived in a place where people kind of came, and they, they, you know, living in the Bay of Islands, you do have a lot of travelers, international travelers coming through. So it wasn't that unusual. Um, for him to go away with me was a little different. Um, we did go away and then we went to Australia and then we came to the United States and he actually did not go back home for about 10 years after we left. And I think that was kind of annoying to his family. It partly was, we didn't have enough money. Um, we never had enough money and he, we had three children and it just became impossible to do that kind of travel again. But I think his family resented the fact that he didn't come back for a long time. Now he goes back regularly. So you're, if I got it right, were you reading for a PhD then or had you just finished your undergraduate education? No, I was in the PhD program at the so, university. So what, what, that that's what I thought. So what, what was your subject? Well, I was in the about? English department. That's and what probably, I thought. So nothing right. to do with Polynesian anthropology. No, no. I have this sort of idea of how this worked, which was that I, I, I wrote this, I got all these fellowships to go and I said, I'm going to go and I'm going to read Australian literature. That's where my, you know, this is my brother said, well, that won't take long. Snarky <laughs> thing to say. <laughs> so, rude. <laughs> yeah, totally rude. Um, so anyway, I thought I was going to read contemporary Australian literature and I got to Australia and I started reading contemporary Australian literature and I, very quickly realized I had no idea what it was about because I didn't know anything about Australia. So I didn't know why anybody was concerned with X, Y, or Z. So I thought, okay, I must read some Australian history. I started reading Australian history. 
And the part that I really liked was the earliest part. I really liked the stories of, you know, Captain Cook and the whole discovery of Australia and the, um, the, the voyaging and, um, and, you know, the British Royal Navy. I was a bit of an Anglophile anyway. So, you know, and I liked that. I love, I, you know, I love the enlightenment. And I love, I love the 18th century. And I, so anyway, I got really excited about all that. Well, if you read, if you, if you get focused on that part of Australian history, what you're really interested in is the history of the Pacific, because that's what it is at that point. And it's New Zealand as well. It's the islands. It's all of it. So I had, I ended up writing a dissertation that was really about, it was really about people coming to the Pacific as of course I had come to the Pacific and it was a real mishmash. It had anthropologists and had D.H. Lawrence and it had everybody and his dog in it. It was a shambles. And, um, uh, uh, <laughs> but, but, but it, it, you know, it, it drew me into the, to the field. And then I got it's kind of stuck in the Pacific history section of all of that. Well, now with the, with the benefit of some hindsight after having written all of that, what is your view of Cook? I mean, to me, no, I'm not going to say what my view of Cook is, but the man, 18th century explorer, most firmly associated with, with the Pacific, although he neither discovered Australia nor New Zealand, I mean, there were Dutch people that did that before him, but nonetheless, he's, he's generally associated. Is he a tyrannical, colonial, um, horrible person, or is he a, a noble, courageous? Well, how, how do you place him on, this, on the spectrum? I find myself in the not always enviable position of being a defender of Cook. Um, Good, I we're speaking do... the same language. <laughs> I, I do love Cook. I, I do think that he is, um, I don't think he's a man of huge imagination, but I think he is a very, um, very disciplined uh, uh, operator. And I admire the, you know, the courage and the doggedness and the fact that, for example, that he, he knew, you know, he took all of the kind of existing data points, the Marquesas, New Zealand, you know, Tonga, where of course lots of people had been, and of the sort of where things were in the Pacific at a time when it was really not very well known to Europeans where things were. It was sort of, it was sketchy, a lot of it. And he went and looked for every single piece, you know, to try and nail it down. Because for him, you know, he's basically like a, he's a cartographer, you know, I mean, in a sense, he's the guy, he's the, he's the, he's the surveyor. So he wants to know where everything is, but he did a lot of hard work to, in order to determine that, to sort of lay that stuff out. And I admire that a lot. And I also think that he was mostly pretty reasonable and not always, and towards the end, much less so, you know, I mean, I think there is a real gradient there that he is a, in a way, a better man in the beginning than he is at the end. But I think he was probably totally exhausted um, and maybe sick, but, but and also maybe just irascible. And of whatever. course died in Hawaii, I mean, was, was killed, was he not? Yes, he was, but, so, but, he was, but he was crabby, you know, in, those, in that last voyage. He did a lot of not very nice things in that last voyage, which he really didn't do in the beginning. He tried a lot harder in the beginning to sort of find the space between people's understandings and to kind of not go and just kill a bunch of people. Because of course that was the, that was the end game in those encounters was that somebody died. You know, and you were trying for it not to be your guys, but in, in order to forestall that, you then killed the other people. So that was a, pretty much what happened in a lot of that stuff. So and I felt that he was, um, it, I feel that he was restrained and, 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 and a trying to be cautious about that uh, uh, in comparison, especially to some people who were just rampaging, you know, at the same, in the same era, um, who had much less, uh, Mm, I don't know what, I, I think of it as sort of discipline more than anything else. Let's, anyway, that's where the, I can find out. Right. So for, for the benefit of some of our audience who may not be totally familiar, let's, let's define certain things. One has a vague appreciation that in this great sort of universe of Pacific islands stretching all the way from Indonesia over to California, um, there are essentially three groups of people the Melanesians, the Micronesians, and the Polynesians. Define each of those groups, if you will. Who, first of all, are the Melanesians? So the most interesting thing about that language, the Micronesian, Melanesian, Polynesian language, is that it is sort of 
maybe useful-ish in Micronesia, quite useful in Polynesia, and useless beyond any measure in, my, in Melanesia, because Melanesia is a super complicated place with lots of very deep history. The first people into the region, I mean, if you include, you know, you include Australia in this and you're looking at people who have arrived at some point, maybe 50, 60,000 years ago, certainly 30, 40,000 years ago into Papua New Guinea, even 28,000 years ago in the islands north of Papua New Guinea. I mean, really, really deep history. So lots and lots of time for people to divide and turn into different groups and to evolve different languages and to sort of differentiate themselves from one another. So that's one strand. So that term Melanesia, which of course just refers to sort of black islands, I mean, is just, it's just kind of a racist European term and it doesn't help us understand really anything about that region. Micronesia is something maybe you know more about than I do. <laughs> I don't know, it's a place, an area I've never been to. So I, I feel always a little bit, but it's a complicated region compared to Polynesia sociologically, I think, and anthropologically, let's say like culturally and historically, it's got more layering in it in terms of different waves of people arriving. Um, but it does have a, a, a base a group of kind of Austronesian voyagers who come in at some point from some place. And the Polynesian story is probably one of the most fully researched, I think. It's had more attention paid to it. It's also in some sense the simplest because you only have really one flow. I mean, you may have multiple uh, uh, iterations of it, but it's kind of one group of people who leave the western edge of the Pacific, who leave the islands around Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands and so forth, and start these great migrations out into what is ultimately the middle of the Pacific Ocean and in the North Pacific and the South Pacific as well. And that's really only one kind of group of people. So give us the, um, the territorial dimensions of Polynesia. It's a triangle. What are triangle. the three points of the triangle? So in the north is Hawaii, and then the, the two bottom points are uh, New Zealand and Easter Island, which is also known as Rapa Nui. New Zealand is also known as Aotearoa. So those are the Polynesian names. That's the triangle. It's 10 million square miles. That's the number that people use. I don't know. We never did measure and, it. Um, it was first journeyed over, talking about European people, by whom? So uh, Magellan crosses in 15... 20 ish. Yep. Uh, and then he doesn't find anything. He doesn't meet them, put it that way. He finds things, but doesn't meet them. But Mendania comes from South America in 1595 and reaches the Marquesas, which are north and east of um, uh, Tahiti. And he is the first known contact between Europeans and any group of Polynesian people. And that's 1595, but then it's, there's a long gap. So you get the, in the 1600s, you get the Dutch coming in and they find various things, New Zealand and Tonga and so forth. And then eventually the British and the French arrive in the 18th century. And the first appearance of the word Polynesia is by a French navigator. I think it's initially a French word, I believe. Yeah, I think it's uh, Durville in, uh, at 1830 something. Yeah, I think well, that's... a little earlier than that, I think. Is it? Um, so I think so. I think there's a man called De Bross, B R O S S E S. Oh, oh De Bross. According, yeah. yeah, I think according to the OED, the first is he. There was a French book on oh. navigation in the in the Pacific Ocean, and he says, "I'm going to call these islands." Polynesia. Oh, does he? Oh, I didn't I, know I, that. Great, I thanks. So. <laughs> that would be 18th century, yeah. Yes, it was wow. 18th century. Mm. So, uh, and where did Cook go first and why did he go there? Was this all to do with the transit of Venus or is it yes. something else? Yes. It is, yes. He was observing yes. sent by the, the court, as it were, in Britain to observe right. for scientists the transit of Venus. Right, he gets sent out. The, the, there's this, the wonderful story about this is that, um, when they, the, the, the transit of Venus is going to happen in 1769 and the Royal Society and various other people want it observed and the, 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 the cone of visibility, the area in which it can be observed during, you know, daylight hours is in the middle of the Pacific, which is the first time this has happened, you know, recent, you know, in the 1761 transit is more visible in Europe, but this one's in the Pacific and they don't have anywhere to observe it from, which is kind of, you know, a problem. So they only have these various 
sketchy locations, which they don't really know about. And then, of course, what happens is that Wallace in the in the Dolphin in 1764 finds Tahiti and he comes back and he, he, it's within months of Cook's departure on this transit of Venus journey. And Wallace says, I found this great island. And that sort of starts, it's so accidental, you know, and then Cook goes to Tahiti and sets up there and observes the transit. And that's sort of the beginning of the, I don't know, modern- This is the place where he, where he set up his instruments. Is, does that still exist? Is it memorialized? Yes, there are, yes, there are all kinds of memorials. I mean, nobody is very keen on Cook anymore. <laughs> so, you know, it's in the Pacific. He's become the symbol of the, you know, I think, you know, the scene is the leading edge of the, 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 of the colonial era. And I, I understand why, I mean, that is true that his, his knowledge is what, or his, his, his work is in a sense what makes it possible for many other people to follow him because he makes the, makes, he tells everybody where stuff is and then they come along. Um, and, you know, the missionaries come almost immediately after yeah. Cook comes, it comes back and reported. So when does um, Cook, is it on this first expedition that Cook picks up this guide, this remarkable Polynesian guide, who, um, you'll have to remember, remind me of the name. Tupaya. Who? Yes. Is it on that journey or is it on a subsequent one? No, it's on this first, on this first trip. So that, this that... is the extraordinary moment. I find it very moving and you describe it beautifully in, in your book, Sea People. Um, when he comes first into New Zealand with this chap who is a speaks the language of where does he come from actually which island is he from is he so he's Rayatea yeah right Rayatea so we've got the coast set the scene for us what happens as the ship is nosing its way into an anchorage and you know the terror on both sides um, of unknown people encountering each other what happens Right. So, so there is this guy, I call him a Tahitian for shorthand, just so that people can kind of understand what he is. This fellow from the, that archipelago is on board with Cook. And he is a man of, um, he is a, a very, he's a, a man of substance. You know, he's a, he's a himself a navigator. He's a priest. He's a very knowledgeable person. So he's a man of stature. And um, he is with Cook and he has been with Cook this whole time on the, um, on the journey from the Society Islands down to New Zealand, which has taken a long time. And they have arrived there, they've arrived in New Zealand. It's quite clear, I think, that Tupaya does not know what New Zealand is. New Zealand is quite different from the other islands of Polynesia. It's, 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 it's colder, it's, it's, it's continental, it has these huge mountains, it's darker, all these things. So they arrive and as they come in, they, the, the Maori are on, you know, are on the, um, Sure. I mean, they're sort of, I think, kind of hidden at this point. And Cook comes in and they drop anchor and then they get out in their boats and they come and they're going to sort of make contact here. And on the first day, Cook goes with his Marines and there is this kind of chaotic situation where they go down the beach and these Maori come out of the bushes and they apparently seem to be trying to capture one of the small boats. And then one of the Marines shoots one of them and they kill this guy and he's lying on the beach and Cook comes running back with his men. And it's just, a, it's just a, you know, it's a, it's a mess. They leave the guy on the beach um, and they go back to their ship. And the next day, they're gonna try it again. <laughs> and now they're, everybody's more anxious, right? Because it's, it's, it's clear that this, there's hostility here and we don't know what's gonna happen. And Tupaya goes with them. And as they are approaching the shore, and these Māori are there on the shore, Tupaya speaks to them in Tahitian. And you can imagine what he must have said. He would have said something like, I am so-and-so, I am coming, I am visiting you in your land, you know, I greet you, whatever he said. Who knows he what he has said? No exactly. idea. He has no idea that he's going to be understood. I mean, as far as he's concerned, he might be speaking gibberish to them. Possibly. I mean, I don't think he has any indication yet of who they are, really. Nobody seems to really know. There's a little bit of a sense that there might be some connection because Banks notices that these people have these facial tattoos. Oh, Banks, and let's just give you a time out for a moment. Once again, we know who Joseph Banks is, but tell us, one of the most remarkable men on the expedition. Give us right. a short footnote on Joseph Banks. 
So he's the young gentleman who travels with Cook. He is a man of um, he, wealth and he, he is a, a natural amateur naturalist and a young person with like lots of ideas and enthusiasm. And so he is observing everything as he goes along. And um, anyway, so Banks has had maybe a little bit of an inkling, but I don't think Tupaya really knows. I don't think Cook knows. I don't think anybody really knows. And what happens is Tupaya speaks and he's understood. And they have been, you know, this is thousands of miles away from where he comes from. And they have been traveling across this vast ocean with nothing in between. I mean, there may be a few islands, but they didn't see any of them. And it, nobody, I think nobody's expecting this. And it's, it's, it's really kind of mind opening for many people because it suddenly becomes clear that the language of this place and the language of these islands way up in the middle of the Pacific are v so close that they are, uh, you know, uh, understandable mutually understandable. And, and that's just, I mean, it's, I just had, when I realized that, I don't think I'd ever known anybody, seen anybody say that before, but when I realized that I thought, holy moly, <laughs> you know, this is a breakthrough moment. And, and of course, linguistics does become one of the earliest tools that anybody has to, that anybody uses or thinks to use to uh, try to connect the hit, to, to try to tell the history of where different people come from. They say, well, these two people speak a similar language. You know? I mean, in, in Cook's journals, is, is the reaction recorded? I mean, it comes across very powerfully in your book. I, I was extraordinarily moved by it. It's did, quiet. Did he say, they understand you? This is incredible. It's quiet in the journals. It's really, really quiet. Yeah. Yeah, it's really quiet. That's why it was so interesting to me because, I mean, the, you know, they may have been, I mean, I don't know. You can't see what they say, what, the, what they think. You can't see what they're thinking. But, but, but they get very interested, but they're very interested in the linguistic connections. You know, banks, everybody is recording words and they know, um, I think partly because, you know, the Indo-European thing is, I mean, people are starting to think about language families already. They are into that period where the idea of language families exist, the, the, the notion, you know, basically based on kind of British experience in India, where the discovery of the, the recognition that Sanskrit is related to Greek and, and Latin is again, one of these mind opening moments where people say, oh, Oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is history. This is the history of movement, of human movement when we see these languages connected. And I think that was a very powerful, powerful tool. And already they were thinking along those lines in the 18th century, and then very much more so in the 19th. So did, did this um, recognition of the commonality of language produce peace and harmony between Cook and his men and the people on shore, I take it there was no more killing after that, or was no, there? No, there was, there was still killing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, killing goes on. Well, I mean, I think part of it is, is I think that, you know, every encounter is a new encounter and every encounter as they, they move along, along the coast and they, the, the, you know, the Europeans get better at, well, I don't think they get better. They get a little bit more understanding and they start to know what's going to happen a little bit. And the Maori start to become familiar with them and so you know but there is a lot of and the British used some techniques I mean I think may all explorers during the all European explorers they used some techniques where they would kidnap people periodically to control to to use as uh, hostages basically um, and that was a technique well, they used that never went how well. How long did, you, did um, Cook remain in New Zealand on that trip and did he go from I, I'm you know this obviously terribly well. Did he then turn west and go to Botany Bay or was that a subsequent expedition? That's that trip. That's the same, same trip. trip. Yeah, it's the first Amazing. one. Class Amazing trip. Amazing trip. I mean, first he circumnavigates New Zealand. So he yeah. goes, he finds, he identifies, because up until this point, so Tasman has found, has, I found New Zealand in 1642, but he only has a little fragment of the coastline because the story of Tasman is sort of, I've always thought it was kind of hilarious because Tasman arrives and he doesn't even get off his boat, you know, or his ship. He is, they, they're trying to have some inter, they have two ships and they're trying to send some communication back and forth and the Maori attack them in canoes and they kill them all. Well, not all of them, they kill a bunch of them. And, and Tasman just says, whoa, you know, I'm, I'm not stopping here. And he gets, he hightails it away. So he has no 
grasp really of what it is he's where that place is so when cook arrives there's very very little understanding of what the land shape is and so he does this circumnavigation to, and he realizes that it's cook Strait, divides the two islands and so on and so forth and he gets all the way down to where Invercargill and Dunedin and down to Bluff Island or Stewart Island I mean he rounds mm -hmm. that goes up the the west side past the Alps does he do all of that or just he does, so he, he, does, he, he, does a, he goes he see, I think he goes north he, he hits the North Island I think he goes north and around down and through the strait and around and back up I'm right. not exactly sure I'm not exactly sure what he I, anyway, I can't then, then he head, then he heads west and goes to the famous landing in Botany Bay and I, I know this is not Polynesia so we shouldn't spend much time discussing it but I was considering what's happened with all the Australian fires in the last year, he discovers these people, ethnically obviously very different from those he met on in New Zealand, who were the Aboriginal Australians, um, but managing their forests, their woodlands, in a way that was, according to Banks, I think, similar to England. It was manicured, it was cleared the underbrush, the understory was cleared away in what seemed to them all to be a remarkably, I mean, they say this in a condescending way, remarkably sophisticated way. But this very much goes to the way that indigenous Australians have for years, centuries, thousands of years, managed their forests by using this technique of setting cool fires, as they call it, to clear away the detritus, thereby stopping the kind of devastating fires that have engulfed southeastern Australia recently. And, and it was interesting that that was noted in the 18th century by Cook and Banks, that these are a, in a simply in a botanical sense, a very sophisticated people. I think people were, you know, I, th I mean, that's the, kind of the other reason that apart from this kind of leading edge of colonialism thing that I find the 18th century, uh, some of them, not all of them, but many of the, um, these voyagers in the 18th century interesting because they were looking at quite a lot of different things. They were looking at the plants, they were looking at the animals, they were thinking about things like, um, they were thinking about things that we would think of as anthropological. You know, we would think of these like, you know, agricultural practices or whatever, like people noticed I don't know, they noticed all kinds of things about how people mulched their plants or how they, you know, well, I don't know, all kinds of different kinds of things. So I like the fact that they were really inquiring, they were really looking um, and writing it down, which was helpful to us. Uh, because, you know, this recording of this information, we would not be able to see it anymore if, if, if someone hadn't written it down. We would not know it. Time passes, things change. And unless somebody writes it down, you know, it's lost to us. So. There's a wonderful sketch shown by these British comedians called Mitchell and Webb, um, which shows in full uniform um, Cook and Banks landing in Botany Bay with, with Cook saying, this reminds me of nothing more than whales. And his <laughs> sidekick says, what? Um, you know, real Carnarvon? He says, no, 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 South Wales. You know, far different. <laughs> and, and, which is equally crazy. So I propose to call it New South Wales. And the, his sidekick says, this is ridiculous, doesn't it? Like it? <laughs> why, was it why was it called New South Wales? Have you any idea? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's lots of crazy stuff about naming. Um, you know, the name of new, the news, you, you can look from now until the rest of you, you know, the end of your life for the explanation of why New Zealand is called New Zealand and you will never find out because it seems to have been some miscellaneous cartographer. Like it doesn't even, we don't even know the naming story. And so I don't know, there, there's, um, there are a lot of, I mean, one of the things about naming that got kind of, in, was kind of interesting to me, I was thinking about that a fair bit because when I was thinking about the uh, different, the history of the different, of the settlement of the different islands and the voyaging between them by these pre, the sort of the, the, the people who became Polynesians effectively, um, you know, they carry the same names. They do the same thing. They have, so for example, the big island of Hawaii 
is actually named after this ancestral homeland, which is called Hawaii or Avaiki, or there are many different names for it, but it's all the same name. And you see it in all these different places. And there are all kinds of, there are a bunch of really interesting books where people actually have tried to trace the place names, you know, relations of place names in New Zealand versus in Hawaii, which is they're so far apart, we don't imagine that there are people going back and forth between those two places, but there are place names that are the same. So they come- Don't you, uh, don't you find it delightful, charming, right, that increasingly, and in the first stanza of the New Zealand National Anthem, the name of the country is now rendered increasingly Aotearoa, land of the long white cloud, which is so beautiful, so non-imperial, and so lovely in terms of its sound, Aotearoa. How beautiful is that? I probably haven't got the pronunciation right, but it is charming, is it not? It's great. It's wonderful. It's fabulous. It's, you know, and I think one of the things, you, one of the issues you have when you write um, about other places for, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't write for people in New Zealand who all know more than I do about those subjects. Um, I write for Americans who don't know much about it at all. And I'm always a little torn between, you know, you want to teach them the new language, but you also don't want to make it difficult for them to understand what you're saying. So you sort of use the terminology that, is familiar and then introduce the new terminology, but maybe don't go all the way over. I don't know. I mean, the one thing that New Zealand, the thing I've been surprised by is that they haven't changed their flag yet. So anyway, for the New Zealanders in the audience, next time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I speak as an Englishman here, although like you, I'm a dual citizen. But let's, let's now look more generally at Polynesia. <laughs> where did they come from? And when? And that's the when is, as to me as fascinating as where, but the Lapita people tell us about that. Right, so what the general consensus is that what we have is a migratory people leaving ultimately the Asian mainland, but we sort of locate them originally in Taiwan, again, through a linguistic pathway. That's the main so pathway to Taiwan. Do Aboriginal Taiwanese speak a language which is connected to most Polynesian languages. Yes, those languages are kind of lumped together as Formosan and the Formosan languages are part of the Austronesian language family as are Polynesian languages like Hawaiian and Maori and you know, Tahitian and so forth. And in between, there are a whole lot of other, you know, lots and thousands of other languages. It's an enormous language family. All the, not all the languages, but you know, pretty much all the languages of the Philippines and of, in many of Indonesia, not so much in Papua New Guinea, but around the edges, lots around the edges, um, and then all through Micronesia in places and, Melan and um, Polynesia. So lots and lots and lots and lots of languages in this family associated with this moving population of what are referred to as Austronesians. And um, so let's say five to 6,000 years ago, about, um, leaving these, you know, a, clearly an island people, an oceanic people, a people who take their living from the sea, who, uh, who are familiar with, who, who travel on the sea, who are comfortable traveling on the sea, who seem to prefer, as you find them later, further on down in this pathway, who seem to prefer, for example, islets off of islands rather than the interiors of islands where there is a mountainous area particularly. In some cases that may be because the mountainous areas were already inhabited. When you're in Melan when you go down through, um, you get into Papua New Guinea and the islands around there, you have people who are already there when these people start to come through. Um, so yeah, so, and they, they are um, somewhere in that journey, they, develop, it looks, seems like what they do is they develop the outrigger as a technology. And the outrigger is the stabilizer that enables you to take a narrow uh, craft onto the ocean, out the, out the open ocean. So did, did the, first of all, the, the people, the indigenous people of, of Taiwan, who are relatively few in number to this day, um, are they a coastal people and do they use outriggers or not? I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think the answer is no, they don't. So I, I I'm just, we, I'm sort of fantasizing here. How, what, what is it? You've got this group of people living on the east coast of Formosa, let's call it what it used to be called. 
looking at this endless ocean to their east and thinking, why don't we take a trip and see what's out there? <laughs> let's go somewhere. <laughs> let's go somewhere for the weekend. <laughs> I mean, that, that always, uh, there wasn't privation on the island. I wonder what prompted them. This uh, Anthropologists know far more about this and I find it endlessly fascinating. What prompts someone to cross an ocean? I mean, we know why, why Columbus crossed. He was under orders to do so to find India. But what prompted a Lapitan person to go eastwards when he had no idea what was on the other side of the horizon? You know, this is this is the sixty-four million dollar question or whatever. I mean, it, I don't know that one can answer this. But the the thing you said about how it's not privation that that prompts people to leave is an interesting one because a lot of people would have lo sort of said most logically, well, you know the. Uh, we're strict. We're 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 running out of resources. We don't have enough land. We don't have enough food. Let's move on. We need a new spot. We you know, and that surely was true in some cases. But there are some great examples. For example, Samoa is an interesting one. Big islands, comparatively speaking, <clears throat> and the amount of time that people are kind of in Samoa before they sort of set out again is not at least from the this is my understanding really long enough for them to use up what's there in terms of marine or, um, or, or terrestrial um, resources. So it's not really possible for them to have kind of overpopulated or, or run out of stuff. So they're clearly not doing it because they have to. Now, there, there's always the question of sort of familial tribal power struggle stuff that I think is probably plays into this quite a bit because in the stories, the lore that's kind of handed down, and I think a lot of it is, you know, pretty darn old in its essence. Um, there are a lot of stories of younger brothers or cousins or, you know, uh, sort of second tier people in a family group who get into trouble because they steal their brother's wife or they, that's a common one, or <laughs> they um, do some other thing and they're, they're then in conflict with the group, the powers, the, the powerful in their island, and they sort of have to go, or they choose to go, whether they have to or not, and they, you know, light out for the territories. And, and I think that's a fairly, that's a plausible scenario. Yeah, so do you, which of the Polynesian islands was, in your view, first settled? Would it have been Hawaii, the closest ones, or are there in no. fact close? No, it's Samoa and Tonga. Right. And, so Fiji, Samoa, Tonga is a cluster of, of islands which, which were all, I think, inhabited. They were all inhabited about quite a long time before. Um, Fiji, of course, being Melanesian, is it not? It is, but it's, it's, it's been connected with Tonga and Samoa right. politically and socially, I think, for a long time. So it's hard to know where that... There's some really interesting stuff. There's like interesting DNA stuff that needs to be done over there. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so it's that western edge of the triangle is settled right. quite a long time before the center and then Hawaii is, is, is not the earliest and, New and Aotearoa is the last. Tonga, of course, being one of the last remaining monarchies in the world, is it not? And, it is. Um, it is. One, I it remember is the, only... the, pr the previous king, at least... Um, who was the queen that was at the royal the coronation of our queen? That's what we call Charlotte, but her name was, well, I forget her Tongan name. But anyway, her, the enormous king who reigned for a long time, I came to know reasonably well. And he asked me, he had his shoes made by a company called Duckers in Oxford. And he asked me to pick up a pair and bring them back to him. And they were so big, I had to have a separate suitcase for each shoe. <laughs> what? <laughs> the airport when I arrived in Auckland I think it was they couldn't believe it and then someone said ah yes these must be the king of Tonga's shoes <laughs> he was an enormous man and he used to go bicycling every day on a specially made bicycle with six enormous Tongan policemen running very very slowly beside him yes lest he should wobble they would pick him up and, and ride him enormous people the Tongans when I was in, um, when I was living in Australia, I think it was when I was Australia, I'm not actually sure when this was, but there was this wonderful rugby player named Jonah Lomu, 
Do you remember oh, right. John Loman? They named an island after him. A god among men, I'm just saying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> he was extraordinary. And I must say, I mean, this goes back, I mean, I'm a terrible sentimentalist, and I mentioned in an email to you that I love watching the New Zealand national anthem being played or sung, particularly by this extraordinarily wonderful singer, Hayley Westenra. Um, um, and as the camera pans along the line of rugby players, you get these huge Samoan and huge Tongan rugby players and any other rugby team must go, especially when they do the hooker, <laughs> you think there's no way we're going to win. Occasionally we do, but not often. They're big, big people. So when American, did the- American football is now full of Tongans too, and some ones. Well, yes, they were, but to add to their ludicrous appearance with all these <laughs> ideal helmets and shoulder pads. So, all right, so uh, Tonga and, um, and Samoa were the first to, to be settled. Um, when was Hawaii settled? So the interesting thing about the, uh, the so the dates have been changing. Um, one of the things that, you know, I am not an archeologist, but so I was very preoccupied when I was writing this by the question of dates, because I, I wanted to understand how it all worked and how you knew and so on and so forth. And so I would, I found that I had to be very careful if I read anything that was maybe 30 years old or 20 years old that I had to check and read a paper that was two years old because the dates were changing. And they, the dates have been coming, uh, the, the settlement dates have been coming closer to the present. In other words, the, the settlement period has been getting shorter in a sense. So we used to think that you know, there, there are many, many books you could read where they would say that Polynesians arrived in, say, the, Mar the central Polynesia, so Tahiti and the Marquesas and so forth, at about 300 uh, AD, something like that. So, you know, 1700 years ago. That's no nobody accepts that anymore. It's kind of around the 1000 mark. It really? seems like most of the dates are circling around the 1000 AD mark for most of central Polynesia, including Hawaii, and even more recent for Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is more like 1200. Now, I don't know. I find it hard well, to believe because it's just like yesterday. Just like yesterday and in fact, in fact only what 500 years before Europeans arrived, before Cook's arrival. And it's, it's, only it's another 100 years before the Treaty of Waitangi, which enfolded all of New Zealand under the supervision of Queen Victoria. So- um, And you have is... these large, you have large populations. I mean, that you definitely have these very large populations in, in you have in Tahiti, you have in, in Hawaii, very large populations, large populations in Aotearoa, you have, it's, it's clearly deeply established you know, people have been there a while. So it's just hard to kind of reconcile the feeling of the sort of cultural information, which tells, makes you feel as though these people have been there forever. And this archeological uh, carbon dating stuff, which again, you also wonder whether there's, I mean, the reason the dates have been changing is because there seems to have been error. You know, it's a correction of error in the early dates. It's not that people have been finding different stuff. They've been redating old stuff. Um, but it does make you wonder if they just haven't found it. <laughs> yeah. right, right. So this brings very neatly onto the discussion of how the Polynesians got around. And obviously they were great sailors. I mean, and wonderful navigators. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that leading on, if you will, if not, I'll try and nudge you to talking about Hokulea, this right. remarkable gift by the Hawaiian people to the United States for the bicentenary in 1976. So, but first of all, how did they get around? Right, so um, I mentioned the outrigger, the development of the outrigger. So the outrigger is the key technological innovation that um, enables, as I said, you do it to take a narrow craft and to sail it across the open ocean. Now, the outrigger becomes a double-hulled canoe in a sense. That's another version of the same thing. So a catamaran, basically. And, you know, with a catamaran, we have two hulls, you can put a platform across them, then you have like a 
you know, you have a vessel that's capable of carrying both a lot of people and also stuff, which is what you need to be able to do if you're going to make these long voyages. So that clearly is what happens. They figure out how to do this. They figure out how to, and they also figure out, of course, they figure out how to navigate, you know, uh, across increasingly large distances. So the thing that's kind of amazing when you look at the map is that as you're leaving the western edge of the of the Pacific, you have a lot of intervisible islands, islands you can see the next one. And that goes on for quite a long time. And then there's a point at which that's not true anymore. And now you have to make a big leap. And it turns out that the gaps, you know, the first gap is to the Santa Cruz Islands and to Vanuatu and to New Caledonia and then out to Samoa and Tonga and Fiji. Those are big gaps, big gaps. And, and, and then it's even bigger. It gets bigger and bigger. And of course, the run from either Tahiti or the Marquesas up to Hawaii is just, you know, it just, you just can't even imagine how anybody could, could have done that. And how they did it the first time, I mean, I, 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 you know, it's just, <laughs> I don't even know. But um, so they're making these voyages, they're, they've got the, te the technology they need in a sense is they need, they need the navigational ability. So they need a methodology, a navigational methodology that will work. And it has to be, it has to be flexible because all kinds of things are changing. You know, as you would go, on, a, on an east-west line across the center, you've got one set of conditions. Once you start to go north and south, you know, your stars are really changing in a big way. So your, head, your star paths, your, your navigational, your key navigational kind of tool is, is something that you have to sort of reinvent. But not only that, I mean, you're entering the doldrums, you're entering a different pattern of trade winds. So everything's exactly. changing when you go north-south. Exactly. So those are the challenging journeys which does bring me on to, to Hokulea because they used the techniques, they distilled into one all the techniques that had been so successful, which, which were half forgotten um, by it, contemporary Polynesians. Right. They, they, they had, Polynesians had stopped making those big voyages. I think when the Europeans arrive, I think there's pretty good evidence that they're still, they're traveling, they still have pretty big canoes. They still have big, pretty, D big double hull canoes, they're still voyaging inter archipelago, you know, it, within certain kind of fields, but they don't seem to have been making the really long runs anymore. And that's one of the mysteries is that there's no, you know, there's no eyewitness report of these having been done. They've been done, they were done hundreds of years earlier and nobody really remembered how to do them and they weren't doing it anymore. So why would they except, retain that knowledge? Except this one man called Mar Piano. Well, well I think what was going on I think what's going on there is that, so uh, the story of, 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 of people sort of thinking about this, and David Lewis is the guy I think that needs a certain amount of credit here for, he was a, a British physician and a sailor who got interested in this problem. He spent some time in the Cook Islands when he was young. He um, got, decided to quit his practice and start sailing around the Pacific. And he, he went and discovered that there were people practicing traditional navigate, non-instrumental navigation in Micronesia and in a few places sort of like in the Santa Cruz Islands, it's kind of in that area, but especially, um, you know, in, in the Marshall Islands and places like that. And that was where he started. He went and observed a bunch of people who were doing it and began to realize that there was this, there were very well-known techniques. There was a methodology, there was, and it was handed down. You know, it's transmissible. You have to be able to teach it to the next person. You have to be able to modify it for new conditions. Like these are all the things, the requirements of a, of a system that's gonna be, that's really gonna work. So he goes and he basically interviews all these people and watches them. And that was where it became sort of more widely understood that there were people who did know, but there weren't any in Hawaii and there weren't any in Tahiti. There weren't any in Aotearoa. They were, they were in this other part of the Pacific and they were not traveling, they were traveling hundreds of miles, but not thousands of miles using right. these techniques. So they built this, this boat, finished it in 76 and gave it notionally to the United States as a, as a gift and then decided to sail it. And I'm compressing the story and I'm sure you'll correct me in the finer details, but they found down in the Caroline Islands, this man, Mar Pialo, who did know, as you have suggested, and these techniques of using clouds, seabirds, the swell, the patterns, recognizable only to people who were compelled because they didn't have compasses, they obviously didn't have wristwatches, they didn't have sextants. 
And yet it was a successful navigation system and for long distances. They brought him up to Hawaii, showed him the boat and said effectively, take us to Tahiti. <laughs> <laughs> and he got there. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the things that when, when I do this, when I, when I talk about this, when I have my slides, I always show a slide of, you know, was circled the islands that Mao Piailug comes from, the man who is the navigator, who takes the Hokulea, who is the, the, the recreated Polynesian voyaging vessel, who takes it from Hawaii to Tahiti. That is what he's tasked with. And they get him to do that. And he goes, sure, okay, I'll do that. But you show his islands as a little, like a circle around his little islands, mainly on an east-west axis. And then you show the line from Hawaii to Tahiti running, you know, all these lines of, you know, all these degrees of um, latitude, in a completely different part of the ocean, you know, different weather, different this, as you say, over the doldrums, across the equator, the whole box and dice, and they and this is what he's going to do, and you, you think uh, uh, this is incredible. How they this is an they, how big is the, how big an ask is this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> did they even realize what they were asking this guy to do? And yeah, he did it. He did it. And and I do love the story, which I know you you know as well, which is that because of this question of the stars that there was no way he was gonna be able to find a star path because he didn't know the stars in those regions. Right. So they took him to the Bishop Museum Planetarium and you know rolled the sky and showed him what the star would be. And he made himself a star path, a star map, and he used it. <sighs> that was a genius. He, he's, he slept, I think, in a hammock between the two um, rudders at the, at the back of the two hulls and just so he could be at one with the night sky, night after night after night, and they made it effectively to, I forget where they landed in Tahiti. In the Tuamotus. In the Tuamotus, but got there on the day, sort of almost at the time. It was perfect. Predicted. It was perfect. It was a perfect navigation and he did it. And apparently they say, you know, you don't sleep. It was 30 days and he, I mean, he must have catnapped. There was no way he couldn't have, but I mean, it was a perfect navigation and nobody else on the vessel could have done it. He was the only person who knew how to do it. I mean, it's, it is truly one of the great stories of, of, you know, one of the great adventure stories. And of course, he then, by Vern, these were mainly young people on the boat, led by this tremendously charismatic fellow, Nanoa Thompson. And they, uh, any relations, I don't know. No, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, they taught these youngsters. And, and consequently, now there's a body of people in Hawaii who know how to do this. All which over the lead, Pacific, actually. Well, that's the, that was the point I was going to make, which is led, at least in theory, to a sort of revival of Polynesian pride. But has it? And I think that's oh. my question. Oh, yes. I think it, it's, it's very real. It's very real. I mean, the interesting thing about this history is that this, the, the, the exercise to do this, the decision to do this, to create this voyaging canoe, to try and prove that this was doable, to kind of develop a system that could be taught to other young people, the creation of a whole movement, which did actually become a whole movement, a voyaging movement, with canoes being built in, in the Cook Islands and in, in, the Mar in Tahiti and in Aotearoa and all these other places. Um, you know, that that movement was, you know, it, it was part and parcel of a larger social movement, which was the revival of hula and the teaching of Hawaiian language and the development of a school of Hawaiian studies at the university. And you know what I mean? Like there was a whole lot of stuff. It's the 70s, right? So if you look at that, you can see that this is part of, there were a lot of independent independence movements all over the Pacific at the same time. So this is part of cultural revival. Um, and 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 but I think it was it was powerful beyond belief. I mean, I think nothing in a way could have inspired people um, in the way that the Hokulea and the Polynesian Voyaging Society did in terms of of making giving people a kind of sense of just incredible pride. You know, these are our people, and, and they did this thing when they made this extraordinary decision to go around the world, <laughs> non instrumental navigation round the planet yeah. and succeeded in doing. I have to say that I, what I wanted to happen, I mean, I, as I dare say, you followed the journey day by day and there was a, a chase boat which was equipped with you know, sat nav and all the rest of it to keep watch over them. But there was, they didn't cheat, it is said. And the moment they, they went down, they spent Christmas, if I remember, in uh, Northern Australia, 
and then turned west and headed um, north of um, Mount, whatever it is, by the Gulf of Carpentaria. And then they were in the Indian Ocean, a completely different ocean. Yeah. And then round South Africa and in a totally different, the Atlantic Ocean now. No knowledge of the stars, no knowledge of the currents, the birds, the swells, the anything. They kept going and going and going. And what I wanted them to do, and I remain to this day puzzled why they didn't, was that they should have, having gone up to the northeast of the United States, and I think they went to Halifax, came down to Boston. I don't know, were you there when they arrived? I was. And Well, that must have been, I'd like to ask you about that. But what saddens me slightly is they didn't then go up the Chesapeake into the Potomac River and said to the Hawaiian president at the time, <laughs> here we are, aren't we amazing? <laughs> that would have, I think, the message would have got to the world. But it never did. They then they did go up went, some river. They did, but I, I just like would have loved the Hawaiian, I mean Obama, to have been somehow yeah. involved. And then they yeah. came home. Everyone was happy that they were home safe and sound. But nonetheless, and this is why I think your book is particularly important, because it I mean, as well as being beautifully written and all the rest of it, um, it's telling the world about these extraordinary people. Extraordinary and, in my view, wonderful people, um, in a way that sadly, Hokulea's voyage was its its impact was mainly internal rather than external. Which was what you're doing is, as it were, externalizing their achievements. I want to take this on, for, and I think we must be getting close to the end of our time, but I haven't been told yet. Um, um, how Polynesian revival, if you like is affecting New Zealand itself, because um, I don't need to tell you the history, 1840, effectively all the land was given to the British, which I think is monstrous. And slowly, slowly, there have been some moves, some reforms, particularly after the Fina Cooper march, this lovely old lady who led a march of largely indigenous people to, to the seat of government in Wellington, to protest and say, give us our land back. What has happened? Are the Maoris getting their land back to any degree? So, you know, I, I am, I can't actually answer that for this reason. I um, think that things have changed in New Zealand a great deal since when I was first there. So I was there in the 19, uh, 80s, late 80s. I have to let my dog in. Hang on. Okay. I didn't think that this would be an issue. <laughs> there we oh, go. Don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll juggle. That's fine. He's just barking at me. <laughs> <laughs> we, all have um, dogs. we all have dogs. That's right. Or something. Anyway, so um, when I was there, it, you know, it, I mean, things have changed a lot. For example, I can remember having conversations with people in the kind of late 80s where I would say things like, you know, why don't you have just do it like Quebec? Why don't you just have two languages in this country? Because Maori is this really great language. You have a lot of, you still have some native speakers alive. You know, why doesn't everybody just learn it in school? And, you know, people would say things like, what? <laughs> I mean, I mean, it was not on the radar. Maori language is now on the radar. Very you know, true. everything there's it's there are television stations in it. It's every government publication is in two languages. I mean, it has happened. So for me, that's a real indication of how there has been a, a big shift in understanding. And the that, first verse of the national anthem. Right. Well, there you go. And 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 I think there's just more there's just more recognition that this is a bicultural you know, I mean, it's a multicultural community, a multicultural country, but it, there are these kind of two fundamental populations that have, and that they have, they should have parity and so on and so forth. Anyway, I do think it's changed um, tremendously. I don't know what the status of the land rights movement is. It goes on and on and on. And I don't imagine that it has reached any kind of terminus yet. Uh, people do make claims, land gets given back. Some of it is frustrating, I'm sure. There were a lot of issues about crown land specifically as opposed to land that was in private hands. Um, you know, I think it goes on. My husband pays attention to it because, you know, of course his family has tribal land and they have their own land, um, but not yeah, as much of it as they ought to. Is it up north? <laughs> it's up north, yeah. Yes, yeah. But right. I mean, I think, you know, they just look around and they would say, wait a minute, all of this was ours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
and that's why not what just, it is right now. Why do we merely have to beseech you white people to get a little of it back? Why don't exactly. you give us title to it and you can rent it from us? I think that would be a solution, which if I were running New Zealand, I would advocate for, which of course then takes us to concern. The, the reason I'm interested in this, and this is your show, but I, I have a book about land, which comes out in January, in which I look at these issues, particularly, of course, in the United States, where we took all this land from these people who were in so many ways so much nicer than we white people were and have essentially never given it back to them. I think it's just appalling. Two things, because I do feel that I'm, for some reason the people that run this show haven't sent a warning note to us, but I think we're within an ace of having to be shut down. Um, two things, atomic testing and sea level rise. Atomic right. testing is a legacy of shame in yeah. the Pacific Islands. Would you not agree? I would. I would. And there is some very interesting research that is being proposed by um, a young uh, genomics expert that I happen to know who is Hawaiian, which is a trying, which involves um, doing genetic research on people who've been exposed to the radiation. Um, to see if they're, you know, to see what kinds of, I basically to see what they can see. So I think there's some really interesting knock on research and thinking that is going on around the testing story is not over, is what I guess I'm saying. Yes, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, it largely involves islands in uh, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, you know, we talk in Bikini, of course, but the French, they tested French. The, in, in Polynesia. In the Tomodos. And I, I, I don't know whether you've been at all um, to Pitcairn, uh, have you, as a matter of fact? I have not. Well, I'm very lucky in, in that I've been a couple of times, uh, courtesy once of the New Zealand Navy. Oddly enough, they were running a ship from um, Auckland to Liverpool to take part in some uh, ceremony. And they were going through Panama and they sort of, they gave me a ride. So I was on HMNZAS Canterbury, I think it was. And um, we stopped at Pit Camp for two or three days. And all sorts of stories, which you will know very well about the impending death of Pit Camp because uh, there are no children being born. And that's for a reason which um, we can get to another conversation. But in attempting to run a business in Pit Camp, one of the things they tried to do was um, raise pineapples for export. And they found that they were all contaminated by residual oh. radiation from the French oh. testing. Oh, so you're yes. absolutely right. It is not over. It's not over. Yeah, it's not over. That's not surprising to me because of the wind, the wind patterns and where that testing was done. Yeah, yeah. And that sea level rise, the other thing, sea level yeah, rise. That's is, what I was you know, to ask that. Tell, tell me about it. Yes. Well, I mean, I, 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 I'm not, you know, I, it's not something I, I just, I just, it, it's a disaster. You know, it's a disaster. I mean, there are people living on islands, quite a lot of people living on islands that are sort of at, at a maximum 12 feet high. And, um, you know, I read when I was interested in the atolls, thinking about atolls, I read some descriptions of what happens when there's a really big storm um, and what it's like to be on an island like that, on an atoll when there's a really big storm. And it's, you know, pretty amazing. And now there are storms, you know, the, it's not just sea level rise. It's the question of the ocean heating up and there being more energy in it and there being more storms. And then the storms are the, the base level of the water is higher. And so the storm and the storms are stronger. You know, I mean, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a bad story. Um, and yeah, it's very, very, very bad for the people who live on atolls. I think particularly of um, Kiribati, what yes. used to be called the, Gil the Gilbert Islands, unique in the world in that it is such a vast expanse of little islands that it spans both the Northern and Southern hemispheres and East and West of the International Dateline. So at the same time, it is today yeah. and yesterday and summer and winter all at the same time. <laughs> well, that is a series of islands that is being inundated rapidly. And I believe you set me right here, that New Zealand has recognized the notion of climate change refugees and have said, if any people from Kiribati are being swamped out of existence by rising sea levels, you're welcome to come here. Brackets, particularly if you can help me. Yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't know that, but that seems right. I mean, at the moment, the New Zealand government is kind of the best, the best government in the world. <laughs> <You know>? um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's incredible. everybody I just know. writes all the time, Jacinda, come here, run my nation. <laughs> I especially here, especially now, although we better not get into that. So, um, Polynesia, the Happy Isles, the Happy Islands, is it a happy place? Generally speaking, we'll use that as a to to wrap this fascinating discussion up. Deservedly happy. Well, very beautiful. Some people are happy. Some people are probably not happy. <laughs> I think it's. Um, I think there are there are problems for sure. There are definitely problems all in various all kinds of places. Problems of poverty. Problems of sea level rise. Problems of 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 colonial, the, of colonialism. But I don't know. I love going there. I feel happy when I go there. I think they're so beautiful. And uh, I am very fond of the, the cultures that I know of, in, that I know well enough to know in that part of the Me world. So. It's a beautiful part of the world. Well, thank you, Christina Thompson. It's been wonderful meeting you. Lovely. Just, I'm glad your dog has behaved, <laughs> behaved well. And, um, <laughs> well, no, no, believe you me. And um, we'll, um, we'll keep in touch. Do you know what you're writing next? Are you going to can revisit the story? Or? Uh, I'm maybe going to write about the missionaries. <laughs> excellent, excellent idea. <laughs> Simon, thank you so much. You have your questions are always wonderful, and it's a huge honor for me to be able to talk to you. Yeah, and it's, um, it's re I really, really appreciate your doing this. Thank you. Christina, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everybody. We'll say good bit bye to each other and um, Ken Bali. Oh, I've got to uh, I've got to say things at the end. That's right. I must remember that. Here we go. If I can find my script. Um, hold on a second. Yes. So Ken Bali was made possible with the support of the Yayasan Mudro Swari Saraswati Patron Program and their donors. The Patron Program was created to seek assistance for the survival of both festivals and the foundation. By making a valuable contribution to the ISN patron program, you will be directly involved in delivering both festivals in due time. Your contribution will guarantee the future of Indonesia's most meaningful cross-cultural platform of words, ideas, culture, and the creative arts. Follow at Ubud Writers Festival on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit ubudwritersfestival.com for more information about the patron program. So thank you, Christina, once again. Thank you, everyone at Kembali 2020. Good luck, good fortune. See you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.